Well, it's a, um, it's a privilege, really, to be here with you today. Uh, in many ways, this is like uh, our ministry home, because about um, a year after Phil and Kim became the senior pastors here, uh, Stacy and I had youth pastors somewhere else for a short time and then moved here, and we sort of got to grow up in our roles together. You know, they, they as senior pastors and we as youth pastors, and um, it's just been a been a a joy to be a part of that journey. I want to say a special thank you to the board and staff for inviting us to be here today. Uh, it's, a, it's a real privilege to be here, and we appreciate you thinking of us. In, in 1995, uh, we were welcomed here by uh, Phil and Kim, and so many of you, and uh, so many of our greatest memories, some of the greatest years of our lives were spent right here in this church and in this community, and uh, those memories live on. Uh, so this is kind of our ministry home, sort of where we got started in ministry. And uh, so much of who we are today was because of what happened in our lives while we were here. Uh, and so uh, it's a joy to be here with you. Um, you know, watching those videos and seeing everything that happened, um, you don't realize the milestones you're passing because uh, they happen in a normal day. They happen in an everyday type of way. But when you compress them all into a video, or you compress them into a story, or you compress them into a few moments and begin to unpack them, you begin to understand the significance that flows from a life. And that's what we're here to celebrate today, the significance that, is, that is, has uh, flowed to many of us from Phil and Kim and their family. Uh, I do want to say I'm honored today to have uh, my wife with me today. We celebrated 25 years two weeks ago. And so uh, it's a joy to have her here to be a part of today. And uh, our, our two uh, boys, uh, some of you may remember our oldest, Connor, who is 20 now. He was passed around like a football uh, in the youth group back in the day. He was like the mascot, you know, for the youth ministry. But... He's 20, is a professional software designer. And then our youngest son, Tyler, who was born after we moved away. Uh, he's 16 and is a, uh, going into his junior year and uh, busy with, with all of that stuff. So uh, I'm honored to have them here with us today just to celebrate all of this. It's a, a big joy for us too. So why is today important? What, why is it important that a church take a few minutes and sort of uh, change direction and look back and focus on what's around them. Well, it's important because we're here to give honor. And we live in an honorless society. Uh, people on discussion threads and on Facebook and in media don't give a second thought about shaming or embarrassing or undermining someone publicly. And so if, if you want to be a church that shines today, honor people. And so today is a very important day because we've gathered to honor. I want to show you from Mark chapter 6, verse 1 through 6, why it's important to show honor. Uh, in most of your Bibles, the subtitle is going to say, A Prophet with No Honor. And so if you'll look at Mark chapter 6, verse 1, I want to read a few of these verses together. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. I remember when I used to read that verse, I thought, oh, that he was such a good teacher, it just blew him away. That's not what this means. They were not amazed in a good way. And we'll see that. Verse 3. Where did this man get these things, they asked. What was this wisdom that he's been given? What are these remarkable miracles he's performing? Listen to this. Isn't this the carpenter? Like, he can't do that stuff. Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense. See, this is not a good astonishment. They took offense. Who's this guy think he is? Where does he get off? saying the things he's saying. Where, where, who does he think he is doing these miracles and all this? Verse uh, 4, Jesus said to them, Jesus, not a prophet, not a disciple, not, not a lackey, not an assistant. Jesus, the Son of God said, 
A prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown. In other words, he has honor everywhere else but his own hometown, among his relatives, and in his own home. So the, the more familiar you become, Jesus is saying the principle, the less honor or the harder it is to give honor. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed. Now Jesus is amazed at their lack of faith. What caused a lack of faith? It was a lack of honor. Honor wasn't appropriately given and it had an impact on their faith so much so that Jesus' hands were tied and he could not work there. Jesus does his greatest work in an atmosphere of honor. So why is, why is today important? Because Generations United wants to be a place where Jesus is unleashed to do his greatest work. And the only way that can happen is to be a place of honor. So today what you all have decided to do is not just a tribute. It's not just a reflection. It is a spiritual move in a spiritual direction that will produce spiritual results. That's what you've chosen and, and I honor you for it. You've done a great thing. So where honor is being practiced, Jesus' work is multiplied. So when a pastor and staff honor the people of their church, and when the people of their church honor their pastor and staff, Jesus is unleashed. Jesus' plan, Jesus' will, His presence and His spirit is unleashed among those people. If you want Jesus to work more freely, you have to be a place of honor. So today is not a day off. Today is not a day where we're not doing ministry. Today is not a day since we're focusing on Phil and Kim. It's somehow, you know, like a reunion. It is a reunion. But it's not just a reunion. It is a day of spiritual celebration. I remember when we moved to Mississippi, there was a, an older guy who was a World, World War II veteran. And um, he was the janitor at our church. And uh, I remember the first time I saw him, I was sitting in my office and he walked in and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, honor that man. Every time you're around him, honor that man. I didn't know why. I didn't know him. I didn't know God. Are you trying to tell me he's a troublemaker? You know, I don't, I don't know what that means. What does that mean? I don't know what it meant. But every time he walked in the room, I would stop what I was doing. I would stand up and I would go over and hug him and I would greet him. And for eight and a half years, I practiced that. And nothing ever happened except he was always a phenomenal supporter and encourager of everything we did. And I don't know why I did it except the Holy Spirit told me to and it was a principle of honor. And where there's honor, the work of Jesus is multiplied. 1 Samuel 2.30 is a verse that the Holy Spirit gave me when I was a teenager. And I lived many of the early years of my Christian life out of this scripture. Therefore, the Lord, the God of Israel, declares, I promised that members of your family would minister before me forever. But now the Lord declares, far be it from me. Look at this. Those who honor me, I will honor. But those who despise me will be disdained. In this verse, we learn that honor is reciprocal. When you give it, you receive it. So I fully expect as you spend your day to day honoring the leaders that God has given you, God is going to reciprocate that honor Amen. back onto you. Amen. And you will receive honor. Your, your eyes and uh, the eyes of this community, you will rise in the eyes of this community because you are a place of honor. Phil and Kim are people of honor. And so we've come today to honor them because they're people of honor. So how do we honor Phil and Kim today? I was, I was thinking for the last few months, you know, what, what are the things I could say that would appropriately bring honor to them? So I decided to talk about what kind of people they are. So I just want to spend a few minutes, the last few minutes, just talking about what kind of people they are. Uh, Phil and Kim are people of encouragement. They, they have practiced as long as I've known them. 
lifting people up. Whenever you're around them, it's never about them. They'll never let it be about them. It is about you. And they will lift you up and they will speak word of encourage, words of encouragement. And they will, um, they, they will make sure that you, your needs are attended to and you have what you need. There, there are people of great encouragement. Now, if you know Phil, those of you that know Phil might say, how can that be? He doesn't talk much. <laughs> right? We equate encouragement, you know, with somebody who has a lot to say. Phil doesn't have a lot to say. Did you know the number one character in the entire Bible who is most known for encouragement is Barnabas? And we don't have one recorded word of Barnabas? That's Phil. Not one recorded word. But his actions are felt. His intentions are felt. His influence is felt. That was a new thought for me. When I met Phil the first time, I had only had one picture of what a senior pastor was, and it was a guy who had a joke for every occasion. Sort of like a used car salesman. You know what I mean? Kind of like that feel. And uh, Phil did not fit that at all. In fact, Phil's not even a joke teller. Like, I can't remember if he's ever told me, you know, too many jokes. He'll laugh. He'll laugh out loud. He'll laugh at yours. But that's not Phil's personality. And that was sort of different for me. But as I got to know him, I learned he was a a person of great intentional encouragement. Also of sacrifice. Phil and Kim are people of sacrifice. If I were to give you $438,000, that's that's a pretty good amount of money. You could buy a glorious house with that amount of money. What would you do with it? Would you buy a house? Would you take a dream vacation? You know, would you buy a high-end car? Would you invest for your future? You got to be careful because you can only spend it once. What would you do with it? $438,000. In Phil and Kim's case, I know the answer because $438,000 is the exact number of hours that they have served you as their pastor. And they have sacrificially given emotionally and mentally and relationally in serving you and serving us. That's the number of hours they've spent leading you. You wouldn't have any way to know this. And, uh, and Phil and Kim would never tell you this. But when Phil and Kim became the pastors here, uh, Phil went to the board and took an intentional, significant salary decrease, uh, which was well below the going salary for a senior pastor at that time because he was so concerned that the church would grow, he took that money out of their pocket, put it back into the church's pocket, and that's how the first couple of staff, including us, were hired. They have lived in great sacrifice. Wherever there's great blessing, there was first great sacrifice. And they are people of great sacrifice. Uh, They're also people, as as you've heard in the videos and everyone who's spoken, that offer unconditional acceptance. What I love about Phil and Kim is they always give people permission to be themselves. I remember when we came to interview, we went and hung out in their townhouse and hung out in the living room. And I may have even did something stupid like put my feet on the coffee table. I don't know what I would have done. But, but I can remember that night so vividly and, um, and how at home we felt. And we've always felt that way around them. We've never felt that there was any reason to pretend you're something that you're not. You don't have to try to be better than you are. You don't have to have false humility. Just be yourself. And that feeling of unconditional acceptance has just permeated this church years and years and years and years. Not... Uh, Phil and Kim never wanted you to try to be flashy. But what they've always done is they provided steady, consistent leadership where you could just be yourself. And let me tell you why that's so important. It's, um, it's like quiet, deep water. It doesn't splash a lot on the surface. But when you absorb it in your bones, you heal. And when Stacy and I came here in 1995... We needed that medicine for our soul more than you know. 
And so many of the challenges that we faced after we left here, we had the strength to face because, because of that ministry of healing that flowed into our soul and gave us the strength to endure harder times. And uh, I, I'll always be grateful to you for that. It's provided much strength to our family. This church is like a great old tree that spreads out and casts shade really wide. And you'd be surprised the people who've come and rested in that shade across the years. Pastors who've burned out, ministers who've divorced or whatever, people who've been mistreated in many ways have come and just kind of sat in the back for a while and gathered shade. And that therapy has been like good medicine for a lot of lost souls. Phil and Kim uh, were always innovative. Uh, th this won't make a lot of sense to some of you, but um, they were never afraid to try new things. So uh, back in the day, when people didn't do things like this, Phil decided we're going to have an outreach. Uh, we're going to do a Super Bowl party. And the root word was soup and Super Bowl. S-O-U-P, soup and Super Bowl. And he decided it would be really cool so we put the Super Bowl on the big jumbo screen in the sanctuary and people could just get their soup and they'd come in here and sit and eat. Oh, my Lord. You would have thought somebody's hair had caught on fire that you were eating in the house of God. You know, Ichabod, Ichabod, they cried, you know, everywhere. That you're going to eat food in the house of the Lord. I think you do Wednesday night dinners in here now. I mean, you know, I don't, it's somewhere it dawned on people this is a building. It's not the church. But, but, but Phil was always pushing the envelope on what could we do to be more relevant and to communicate the gospel to people with no barriers. And I mean, as I, this room looks very different than the last time I saw it. And it looks like you're still doing it. Continuing to push the envelope, and you've rallied behind him in an incredible way. Uh, Phil and Kim are people of great wisdom. Uh, Phil is a guy that's blessed with an enormous amount of common sense. So usually at a time like this, you would want to tell a lot of stories, you know, of something dumb. That, uh, that somebody like Phil had done. The problem is I just don't have much. He has so much common sense. He kept him stuff out of dumb stuff all the time. If it were my turn, oh, they'd kill me. They'd slaughter me. Just on the things that come out of my mouth alone, but not. Phil is a man of great wisdom and great uh, uh, common sense. I just don't have a lot of things, of stories like that. I've I thought about it a lot, and I thought, Phil, you should have done more dumb stuff. I mean, it would, it would have been great on a day like today. <laughs> Phil um, never shied away in using that wisdom to make really hard decisions. Uh, I watched him labor and sweat and stay awake at night and contemplate and discuss with the staff, what do we do? Because this is important. It's a crossroads. And what we do, his number one concern was always the church. How would this affect the church? How, is this going to move us the right way? And I watched him take so much personal care over what's the application of wisdom in this moment. What's, when there's not a clear right or wrong, see, that's easy. <laughs> that's easy. But when there's not a clear right or wrong, what's the application of wisdom in this moment? Most people have no idea the responsibility and burden of the, of the leadership uh, that a pastor has in a church and how the decisions they make how heavily they carry them personally because of the reality that it affects so many people's lives somebody used this word earlier that I love authentic Phil and Kim are very authentic They're, they they are who they are they never try to put on they never try to pretend to be someone they're not um, I remember we were at a pastor's retreat one year and uh, I think it was Dr. Rullin that was speaking, and I saw Phil up there, you know, he went up to say hi at the end. I don't think they even knew each other at the time, and he walked up, and he's standing there, you know, and we're at this, we're at this pastor's retreat, 
And Phil's in jeans and like a, not a t-shirt, but something like that. And tennis shoes, you sit there talking. Hey, you, you, you have no idea how countercultural that was. We're at a pastor's retreat, and all these pastors, you know, were all stuck up with suits on and ties and, you know, whatever else they got. You know, they're all walking around all proper. And here's Phil in jeans, you know, come, uh, walking up there. Down Phil Daniels. You know, he's got his mullet. Down Phil Daniels. He's got a big beard. You know, that's what he's doing. That's it. And, and, and I, I talked to the lady and said, well, I thought it was a retreat. I mean, I thought we were getting away from that. I didn't know we were supposed to do more of that here. And, and that's Phil. Just, uh, just authentic as he could be uh, to the bone. You know, um, Phil and Kim have always made great effort to reach out to the one person. It was never about crowds to them. It was about, are you okay? Are you going to be okay? Is everything going okay with you? I, uh, Phil is usually the first person to reach out to make that phone call. When, when we were um, in Mississippi and we were going to be uh, commissioned as the senior pastors there, I called Phil and I said, Phil, would you guys come over? I'd love for you all to be a part of that day. And um, Phil said, when? What day? There was never a question. We'll be there. And he was there. And when we were commissioned at Kingwood Church, I called again and said, hey, Phil, uh, what day? We'll be there. And there they were. And that's just the kind of authentic people they are who really um, have a lot of compassion and concern for people. When we went through Hurricane Katrina, as Tommy mentioned, and man, you've never seen anything like that in your life. Um, Phil was on the phone. What can we do? How can we help you? And sent team after team after team of people who just held our arms up when our arms were so overloaded, we couldn't hold them up ourselves. And so I, I want to thank you for that and, and, and for all of you who were a part of that. You have no idea what it means to feel the rush of the body of Christ coming behind you and just, and just lift your arms up when you know there's nothing you could do. When, when Stacy was uh, diagnosed a few years ago and had been battling the disease she's battling, Phil and Kim reached out and said, we don't want anything. We just want you to know we're here. And, and that's who they are. They've always been there, and I appreciate that. And that's part of the pastor's heart that they have. You might not know this. Every pastor doesn't have a pastoral gift. And I'm not saying that's right or wrong. It just is. Pastor Phil and Kim have a pastoral gift and a pastoral heart. Do you agree with that? They do. They definitely do. You might... Um, not have thought of this one but Phil and Kim are, are people of great um, great confidence what I mean by that is they speak well of people you would think that that would be the minimum standard among leadership in ministry it's not sometimes people will speak to you one way in public and speak about you a different way when you're not around. And it happens in ministry. Or they will just speak to you and you tell them something confidential and then they'll turn around and tell their three closest friends. And that is not who Phil and Kim are. I, I learned that very, very early when we first moved here. There were just things that they would hold privately and you might find out ten years later and say, you knew that? Yes. Well it was confidential and that's the way they've lived uh, you can uh, there's nothing I could ever think of I could pick up the phone and call Phil and tell him and not have the greatest confidence that it would stay with him it would go nowhere else and that's rare in our world especially when you can tweet it out in seconds yeah. ask Donald Trump <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's uh, it's unusual and it is honorable for someone to hold your confidence. And the same way Phil and Kim speak about people and to people, when you're not around, they speak about people the same way. They speak well of people and always have. I, here's the last one. 
Phil and Kim are kind. And I, want, I really want to focus on this for a minute because kindness is such a lost virtue in our world, but it is universally understood all over the earth. Even if you don't know someone's language, you can be kind to them and it will translate. And Phil and Kim are people of great kindness. I can remember the, um, the first time we were in their home after we moved here. I think it was a Sunday night service and Phil said, why don't y'all come over to the house? You know, that's, why don't y'all come over to the house? Oh, okay. I, was, I didn't know what that meant. I was like, what is, what is it? You know, do we bring stuff? I, I don't know what that means. That's it. That's all he said. Okay. So I told Stacy, he wants us to come over to the house. I don't, I, don't know, I don't know what we should do. Should we prepare? I don't know what to do. Do we go home and change clothes? I don't know. So we went over and uh, we knock on the door. Come in, it's open. You know, we come in. He's got his feet up on the arm. He's watching a Braves game. I know that's going to shock you. Atlanta Braves game. We're sitting there, and Stacy was in the kitchen with Kim, I don't know, doing something. Kids were kind of running around. And there we were. And I kept thinking, what is this for? <laughs> what, what, what's, what do we do? I thought, you know, should I bring up something? Is he waiting for me to say something? <laughs> is he wanting me to ask something, you know? He's just sitting there watching the screen. He's not talking. He just said, he got his fill face on, you know? The remote. Like that. You know? And, and, and I'm, just, I'm, I'm just mesmerized because I'm thinking, I know I'm supposed to be doing something and I'm missing it. I don't know what it is. And, you know, an hour passed, nothing. I don't remember if he even, you know, we hadn't even known each other long. I thought, you know, maybe we would get to know or something. Nothing. <laughs> then about 30, 45 minutes, I said, well, I guess we got to go. <laughs> you know, it's getting late. He said, okay. <laughs> That's it. So, so we got in the car and left on the way home. I said, what was that? <laughs> what were we supposed to do? I feel like I missed it. I feel like I was supposed to do something. He was waiting for me to do something. Or maybe he wanted to talk to me about some real big thing or something. No, no that was it. That was it. And, and the more I got to know Phil, the more I realized he just genuinely likes being around people. He just wanted to be there. We didn't have to talk. wasn't important at all. Needed no conversation. Just share presents. We were just sharing presents. And so we sat there. And, and I remember the second time that we were in their home somewhere, not the second time, but uh, somewhere in the middle of our stay here, one of the hurricanes, I don't remember, maybe it was Opal or Aaron or one of them that came through. I, look, I'm a Tennessee boy. I didn't know nothing about no hurricanes. And I'm like, I'm gone. I've seen the movies. Like, I'm out. They kill people. <laughs> I don't know nothing about that. And so uh, we called them and they said, he said, why don't, you, why don't you come over and stay at the house? Why do you think it's any safer over there than it is at our house? What would that do? I would, I'm not gonna, just because I'm standing near you, I'm not safer. And he said, why don't you come over? Oh, oh, okay. I don't know. I guess if he's okay, I guess he lives here. I guess I'm okay. So we came over. They were in their townhouse. We came over and, we, and brought, they let our little dog come. We had a little dog, okay? And we just hunkered down the living room there that night and we stayed all night. I don't remember what storm. Remember that? And there we were, and about you know, 11 o'clock, Phil said, night. <laughs> that was it. He just walked off, just disappeared in the dark. I went, wait, 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 wait. What do we do? What do we do? What if, what if the window blow? What are we going to do? You can't just go and shut the door. That was it. So on the next morning, that was over. Just a hurricane. It's just a hurricane. No problem. It'll blow over. And it did. And I remember the last time that we were in their home. We had resigned and we were moving and um, we had loaded our truck and, you know, backed it up to the house so nobody could get in it. And they said, um, you don't want to stay in that creepy old empty house. Why don't you come over to the house and stay with us? And so we did. We went over and Kim had made a little, they had a little let out bed in the room and they had made it all out and fixed all the cover and they fed us a dinner and 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 she gave Stacy a necklace 
that we still have. And she looked at her and she said, you're going to be a great pastor's wife. We want you to know we love you and appreciate you. And that, come on over at the house, is just kind of a picture in my mind of Phil and Kim's kindness. They were always, look, we're leaving. <laughs> you don't get anything else out of us. But they weren't concerned about getting anything out of us. They were concerned about giving something else to us because it was their last chance. And that's the kind of people they are. So my challenge to you is take the journey. Whatever your history is at Generations United, whether it's your first Sunday or you've been here 20 years, this is a good place. This is a place of great shade and rest and healing and joy and grace. And if you'll just not look for the, for the splash at the top, but look in the deep water underneath the current, the grace and the healing that you need for your soul and that you need to become everything Jesus wants you to be is in this place. And I think the future's brighter than ever and the best is yet to come.